Hello everyone, welcome to a special episode of Living History. This one is a revisit of an episode we did much earlier in the year, an interview with Peter Hart about interviewing World War I and World War II veterans. Now Peter is a fantastic historian from the Imperial War Museum in London and last week we did a great interview with Peter about 1918 and the closing stages of the war and that prompted me to go back and revisit this episode of Peter talking about his life's work interviewing veterans from the First and Second World War. So this isn't going to interrupt the schedule of normal and new podcast episodes we have coming up. This is a bonus episode for all of our new listeners out there who may not have heard Peter's original interview with World War One and World War Two veterans. It's a great episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoy it. Let's hear from Peter Hart. The long way to it's a long way. Hello everyone and welcome to Living History. Today a really special episode. We're going to be talking to Peter Hart from the Imperial War Museum and Peter has spent nearly 40 years interviewing veterans. It must be the best job in the world. He has spoken to World War I veterans, World War II veterans, veterans from later wars. Peter's whole life is talking to veterans and hearing their amazing stories. So I cannot wait to sit down with Peter and hear about those experiences. And also, we're going to hear from the veterans themselves. Peter's brought some of his recordings with us, so we've got the rare privilege of hearing from those veterans in their own words. So that's coming right up in a few moments. Thank you to everyone who responded so strongly to last week's podcast about Kokoda, Uh, definitely the most popular podcast we have done so far, our interview with Carl James. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, definitely do. It was really worth hearing about Carl's uh, fantastic insights into the Kokoda campaign. As always, visit the website, visit our Facebook page. Our web address is battlefields.com.au to hear about everything that we've got going on uh, and to learn how you can walk in the footsteps of the Anzacs on battlefields all over the world. But now, let's get on with today's episode. Let's hear from Peter Hart about interviewing World War I and World War II veterans. I'm Matt McLaughlin. This is Living History. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say, God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terrorist attack. This was their final tower. Peter Hart, thank you so much for joining us on Living History. Great, great to have the chance to talk to you. Now, this work you do at the Imperial War Museum, it's a little bit different, I think, from what most people would think of pure history work. Your focus specifically on oral history and speaking to veterans. And I'm very jealous of the work you do because that is always one of the most exciting and one of the most compelling aspects of history is actually hearing from the veterans who were there. Why don't we begin by you telling us a little bit about the work that you do at the Imperial War Museum? Well, I have been fantastically lucky to, to, to work for the, the Sound Archive, as it was then at the Imperial War Museum. I got there when I was relatively young. I was about 25. Uh, 1981, I started. And, and we got going. Uh, I was put on a, a program of interviewing First World War veterans. And it, it was wonderful. I can't tell you how great it was, because I'd, I'd spent my childhood being a, a geek about cricket, about music, and about the Great War, about military history. And for me to get the chance to interview these veterans, and some of them were people whose books I'd read, you know, uh, I mean, Joe Murray, I'd read his book, uh, you know, uh, uh, and some of the other veterans I interviewed, I'd read their books. Uh, and, and for me, it was it was just unbelievable to, to meet them. Um, they were late in life. I mean, you know, the, you know, they, they were 88 uh, to 96. And this is one, you know, sort of, disadvantage of of, of of oral history is if you catch people too late you can you can sometimes not you know you don't get their best but there were still more than enough great interviews done and i did about 180 interviews in all uh with great war veterans which varied in length from a couple of hours to uh well joe murray was 22 and a half hours you know which is amazing it's something that I just, as I said, I just think is is incredible because I only, in my lifetime, even though I focus so much on the First World War, I only ever spoke to one First World War veteran in the whole time that I've been crazy passionate about that subject. I've spoken to, to many World War II veterans and I've recorded their stories. 
it, it so I'm as I said I'm 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 in awe of the the work you've done actually speaking to these men because that's that's the key to everything we want to know about the about the war to you know these are stories about people and to actually speak to the people I think is is just the most wonderful aspect of the work that you do how do you get the veterans to open up and tell you the story that you want to be told well, it's, it's funny because you'll often hear, oh, they never talk about it. One of the reasons they don't talk about it is uh, is that families don't take much notice <laughs> while they're alive. And then afterwards they've died. They say, oh, he never talked about it. Well, actually, they did. And they do. They talk to their veteran friends who understand it. And they don't inflict uh, their wartime experiences on their close family often. And that's what's going on there. Or the family aren't interested. But we, we approach it very professionally. We explain to them that you know what they were going to do was going to be important that they would tell their story that they they would tell their truth and that it would be passed down through the generations you know and we always used to say imagine if you could you could have the voices of people who fought at uh, trafalgar or, or waterloo and and you know that that's what it was when they fought that the waterloo was a hundred years before uh gallipoli was a hundred years after uh, waterloo for instance and, uh, you know, now it's another hundred years on. And, and now it's, you know, the last one died several years ago. Uh, and it, 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 they responded brilliantly to it. They, you know, those, they, they gave everything they could. And yes, some of them didn't remember much or remember things not, not quite right from our perspective as perhaps historians. But everything they gave us was of value because it's what they believed to be the case. It's what they believed. And it, it's their story. It's very important. To, to, to get their angle. I've always felt with veterans telling their stories that as they get older in life, they do reach a point where I, I, I've noticed that they do feel more of a, they, they, they feel more of a desire to tell their story. And, and I'm just interested in your perspective on this. I think, I think at, at one stage in their life, they reach, well, I want to tell this story before I'm gone. But then I've also found with other older veterans that they feel an obligation to their mates that they served with. And they, they, they look around and they go, well, I'm really the only bloke left. So if I don't tell this story now, you know, all those great stories of Harry and Joe and all the guys I served with are going to disappear. So have you found that in your experience? Yes, very much so. And uh, I wanted to call the book uh, Voices of the Front. I wanted to call it A Long Time Dead because a thing that often came about was they'd say, do you know when Bill died or Tom died, we thought they'd only be dead a couple of months longer than, you know, than me because they presumed that they would be killed in the war as well. And then when looking back on the war 80 years later, they suddenly realized that their, fr- that, that their friend gave up 70, 80 years of life, not a month or two days, but 70 years of life. And they, they, they want that person sacrificed to be remembered so that they could it, they, just so that they continue. Their memory is preserved and, and what they did is preserved. And I think that's that was very, very important to the veterans and increasingly so. It became important to me. In fact, you know, as I've done the job, I've become more and more committed to, to, to preserving the stories of veterans. For us, hearing about their experience in the First or Second World War is just iconic. It means so much to us to hear about it because we didn't live through that experience. But for them, it's just a short chapter. It's a couple of years out of, as you say, a life that could have gone on for 80 years. Do you think they appreciate the significance of what they went through and what it means to us in this generation? I found it very weird. Funnily enough, I noticed it more with the Second World War veterans because the First World War veterans were all at the end of their life pretty well, you know, give or take five years when I interviewed them. The Second World War ones, I interviewed a lot of them when they were in their 60s, which is what I am now. And um, they, they was, they'd they retired. And do you know what? They, they A lot of them said they hadn't thought about it much. They'd, they'd had a family. They'd gone to work. They'd, they'd, they'd been through the, the politics and the, the excitements of the world, you know, and then when they retired, they sort of thought, what was important to me? What, what made, what was the most important thing about my life? What, what is it that I want to, to think about? You know, now I'm sat in my armchair. And a lot of them started to get back in touch with their old mates. Often, you know, they start, there were an amazing number of veterans organizations formed in the, the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, 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 from, well, mainly Second World War veterans, as I say. And they, they just wanted to, 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 re, to reconnect with that past because when they looked back on their lives, that war they fought was incredibly important. The friends they lost, the friends they made, the experiences they had. And you, you like I, have never, never been anywhere near any, any kind of danger like that. 
Uh, and, and we can barely imagine what it's like, uh, except through the words of people who are there. Well, you mentioned Joe Murray as one of the people that you admired and, and really enjoyed interviewing. Um, t- uh, I've, I've read about Joe in your books. I mean, you've been a great link with people to this incredible story of Joe Murray. Um, tell us a bit about Joe and, and his story. Well, Joe Murray was a Durham miner who, uh, who uh, volunteered at the start of the war. He wanted to join the Navy uh, and signed up and uh, was put into the Royal Naval Division, which were, uh, na- they were Navy, but they were serving as soldiers and was packed off to Gallipoli in 1915. Uh, that's where I knew his, his book, which he wrote about 1962, three, uh, Gallipoli as I saw it. And I'd read, that's the book I mentioned that I'd read. Um, and it's fantastically detailed, you know. Uh, and when I went to see him, it was strange because he was a very old man. He was 88, you know, and he was blind. He had uh, tunnel vision. He could only see just a tiny bit in front of him. Uh, and, he, it, you know, his house was a complete mess. Uh, but he had still many of his souvenirs. But the thing that was weird was because he was blind, and I found this with a couple of blind people, he had he had a, a weird, strange memory. Uh, his memory was almost complete. Uh, he described it to me as watching a cinema in his head. And you might be sceptical about them. But when I asked him what level of detail, he said, well, you could ask me what I had in my pockets on a certain day. And I would perhaps remember, you know, and he remembered, you know, the drills for he was later on in, in, in his time, a Lewis gunner. He could remember his Lewis gun drills, uh, you know, 80, 90 years later. He just had the most amazing memory. And his experiences at Gallipoli, I mean, there's a well, which I, I think you probably know it, at the, the mouth of uh, Gully Ravine. And he he helped dig that well. Uh, I've, I've been to where he went over the top on June the 4th. Uh, and I know when you go to Anzac, you, 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 you think of the stories of the people, you know, that you, you from there. And for us British, it's the same at Hellas. And and for me, Joe Murray, you know, when I walk on those fields, we, we actually found the trench Parsons Road where he attacked from on June the 4th. And, you know, you just stand there and look up there and you, you can you can almost feel what it was like, you know. And Joe gives an impassioned description of the, the flies and the, the men fiddling with their accoutrements and, you know, and the, the officer counting down five minutes ago, men four minutes ago, that that kind of thing. And then they go over the top and just run into a mass of machine gun and rifle fire, you know. and Wow, what what a story! And for me, I remember I was almost open mouthed because he couldn't see me. Uh, and and you know, another time he was in a you know he he described how he cut someone's thumb off, uh, who'd done a you know, self self inflicted wound actually, and he he cut the rest of his thumb off, and he produced the knife. He said, and here's the very knife. You know, wow. You know, you're you're a fellow military history enthusiast. I know you are. And you can imagine how I felt at that time. You know, I was 26, I think, when I interviewed Joe. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful man. And we've some say, is it too good to be true? All I can say is that everything we've checked in it has turned out to be true. And it was before the Internet. When he mentions an officer, what happened to that officer, it's all right. He uses fictitious names in the book. And, he, you know, he wouldn't tell me who they were even now. But the officers he named, uh, the, his friends, he wouldn't name, you know especially the one who self-inflicted wounded. <laughs> it's, it's incredible but stuff. But wonderful. I, I, I'm, I'm literally getting chills when I'm sitting here hearing this because I've been to Gallipoli so many times. I've been there with you, Peter, and we've, we've walked that ground. But to me, it's, it's all – there's a very theoretical element about it because I didn't know any of these men. I didn't I, – I, I, I try to imagine what they were like as human beings. I try to imagine their stories. But you can't. You can't, you can't picture 50,000 men or 100,000 men – and understand what they were like as individuals. And I think that's the really uh, important aspect of the work that you've done. Um, and the, you, as you say, the work with Jay Murray, incredible stories, um, and a lot of them harrowing. Um, and it's just, it's, it's such an interesting aspect of history that's so important that, that we preserve. Well, it, it's so detailed. He, later on, he was at, uh, he was at uh, Arras in the attack on Gavrel. I've forgotten the date, but, you know, um, in 1917. And we had a, a, a professor, um, Pete Simpkins, he's quite well known to a lot of people, and he's a skeptic about oral history. Perhaps we'll talk about that later on, that kind of, you know, some people are skeptical. But when he heard the, uh, Joe's account, he said you could follow his track through the village. You know, you could follow his footpaths. You could see the things he said you'd see. I mean, Murray is amazing. Not everyone's like that. I mean, other interviews are great. You know, George Horridge, fantastic, did uh, four or five hours of fantastic material. Lots of people did 10 hours or even 15 hours. 
But Murray, to me, stands out for the the ex, the, the, the nature of his experiences, the colour of his memories, and, and just the way he expresses them. His story of a man dying of dysentery and the way he died is just horrific. It's horrific. Well, let's hear that story now, and let's hear from Joe Murray in his own words about that, uh, as you say, that horrific story of uh, the effects of dysentery. Like my old pal, a couple of weeks ago, he was as upright as a, as a guardsman. And here, after what, nine, ten, eleven days, or whatever it is, you know, see him crawling about, you know, his trousers around his feet, he can't walk, he, this big bladder sticking out of his backside, and this poor devil couldn't do anything, and of course his trousers were all sore. Shirt was all everywhere was sold. My pal got a hold of him by one arm and I got a hold of him by the other. And neither he nor I were, were, were very good, but we weren't like that. You know, we weren't uh, incapacitated at all, you see, but we sort of, uh, it's the green, you know, and they're dragging him through the little tree, you know, uh, after when you remember how you saw him a little while ago, we lured him down next to the city and the flies, and we're trying to keep the flies off him, and we're trying to turn him round, you know, so we put his backside in, in towards the trench, you know. And I don't know what happened, but he simply rolled into this, say, a foot-wide trench, you know, half sideways now, you know, head first into the slime. We couldn't stop it. See, we couldn't pull him out. He was half in and half out. And we didn't have any strength to pull him out. He couldn't help himself at all. We did eventually get him out. You know, what say, he was dead. He drowned in his own slime. It's just such harrowing stuff, Peter. I mean, the, you can hear, even after, I mean, how many years? It was 60, 70 years after those events occurred, you can hear still the the compassion and the pain in his voice when he tells that story. It's just horrific stuff. It, it is one of the, I mean, it's the far end of stories. But the dysentery is quite interesting because, you, you know, in a lot of academic books, that, you know, that don't use oral history or personal experience of, of, our, of our nature, that they don't really understand how serious dysentery is. I mean, you know, you get the statistics. And they'll tell you that so many, you know, the Australians, so many of the British were were, were, were ill, you know, the Turks too, of course. Uh, but you don't understand what that illness is until you hear a story like that, until you hear I've got other people who talked about having to go to the loo 18 times in a day, red raw backsides. Uh, you know, uh, Murray takes us through how, you know, how you wiped your backside. What did you use? You know, paper at first, letters, uh, Bibles. But then when the paper runs out, you use vegetation. And when the vegetation runs out, you just wipe, you know, it's it's crude, but you need to know to understand. And they end up wiping their back, you know, their backside with a bit of mud and then wiping their, their hands on the uniform. You know, and you wonder how dysentery spreads. <clears throat> That's what life is like. And oral history brings out that kind of thing. You don't write a letter to your girlfriend about, you know, that kind of thing. You don't write a letter to your mum or your dad even about that kind of thing. You don't put much of that in, in, in diaries. Uh, in a diary, it says uh, it'll say things like "more of the old trouble." That's classic. More of the old trouble. It means you know they've been got the loo five times in the day, you know. And I, for me, this is important because you, you know, again, you, I know you know the subject as well as I do. At Gallipoli, um, the dysentery is very important to the battles. It affects what happens. You need to understand it to realise. Why, you know, men could come ashore on Monday, fit and hail, and by Wednesday, they were good for almost nothing. They were, they were the ghosts of Gallipoli. You know, they'd lost weight. They were, they, they were on their last legs sometimes. And then they still had to carry on because there was no one to replace them. So they'd be there for weeks suffering like that. You know, it, to me, they, they, that's what oral history is about. It lets you hear things that aren't on the, on, 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 you know, on the, the record. Those specific details you talk about, like the horrific details of dysentery and how it could disable an entire army, these are the specifics that come from oral history. What other things, Pete, do you think come out from oral history that we don't get from other sources, that we don't get from records, we don't get from books? What, what are the elements that make oral history so important? 
Well, you have to be careful how you think about the next thing I'm going to say, because I, I am not in any way disrespecting the soldiers. But this idea that everybody's dying to go over the top and get at the Hun or the Turks. Now, when you interview a large number of soldiers, what you get is that they are willing to go over the top for their king or their country or their god or more likely and most often because of their mates, comradeship. But they don't want to particularly, especially if they've done it before and realize what will happen. You know, and and this is not something present in regimental histories. You, you've read them yourself. You know, you've read those Australian battalion histories. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the lads are always dying to get into action. Uh, that's an unfortunate expression I've just used there. But, you know, because a lot of them do die. Um, but the reality is much more complex. Uh, history is much more nuanced. People go over the top, to the, the top because they have to. You know, and I think that oral history in a way makes you admire them even more, because if they if they wanted to and they were all gung ho, then in a sense, you'd have less sympathy and understanding for them. When you realize they're going over because they have to, you know, for duty, for, you know, for all whatever reason they have to go. No, I, I believe it's comradeship from talking to so many of them. The most important thing. And you get that from oral history. You get that from detailed conversations with people. Uh, I think that's very important. One of the things that history has taught me in learning about this and, and reading as much as I possibly can about the history of these wars is that being in a big army, being in a war, is about losing your sense of individuality. And it's, you know, it's about becoming a very small cog in a very, very, very large machine. And that's what many of these men experienced in a war. You know, we, we use the cliche to say your war is six feet in front of you. But that is the case. I think in some forms of history, we lose that. We lose that perspective that this is a, a large number of individuals fighting in a war because we look at them collectively. We talk about the regiment or the division and the, the great work that they did. And that's what comes out when you read a history book. That's what comes out when you watch a documentary. It's what comes out when you read a unit diary. And that's what I think is just so astonishing about some of these interviews that you've done. Well, really, all of these interviews that you've done is it returns that sense of individuality to the battlefield and the fact that these were hundreds of thousands of individuals who had lives before and after the war if they survived and this was a brief moment in their life and their experience is so important but we cannot capture it in any other way except for the work you do uh, with recording their oral histories well as i said and uh, it's got to be remembered this work was initiated and, and paid for by the war museum i am their employee and so i'm grateful to them for giving me the opportunity that's uh, you know, uh, but yes, uh, and and I, I love what I like most about my book, Voices from the Front. Sorry, I'm not plugging it; it it's gone by now. You know, it's, it's a book from the past. But what 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 I enjoyed most about it was that you did meet so many different types of people. You know, you met quiet, respectable types. You met, you met rough diamonds. You get people who liked a pint or six, even at the age of ninety. Inte intellectuals, eccentrics. You met you met you know. Brave chaps who, I mean, one one old guy I interviewed from Sheffield, I don't remember his name anymore, but he'd been attacked by a, 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 someone who tried to break into his house, and he'd taken him on with a with a with a with a, a, a piece of wood he'd got by the door for that very purpose. Now, whether that's you know he should have done that or not, but that was the you know wow, what a time. And then there are some people I interviewed one chap. Uh, a Durham light infantryman who was scared throughout, who dodged everything he could. But even he, uh, I mean, he, he gave me his reasons. He wasn't a natural soldier. He did his bit. He went over the top. He did as best he could. And do you know what? I liked and admired him as well because he could explain himself. And, and you know, as we, as we said, it's a war fought by individuals, but collectively. And, and you have to understand and appreciate all the different types who make up a battalion, who make up actually a platoon. There's 30 in a platoon. And you can have every type you can imagine, religious types, drunken oafs. You can get any, anything within that, that same unit, you know. I think that's a really important point, Peter, and it's something perhaps in Australia we have to be cautious of because, I mean, you know us, you know, Aussies are always pretty keen to say that, that until we came into the war, you POMs were struggling and you'd all be speaking German if it wasn't for us and all those, you know, all those cliches that we go on about. Um, but I think something that's really important is that there's a risk now that all these veterans are gone. We, we've lost all the First World War veterans. We're losing at an alarming rate the World War II veterans. And I have a real concern that when there's not people around to tell their stories anymore, that we start to turn them into caricatures, that we start to say every Anzac Day that all the men that came out of the boats on April 25, 
1915 were all supermen and they all took on the Turks on their own and all they wanted was to to fight a good fight and get home to their mum and their darling girl and back to their little home in the country and ride their horse and be good Aussie larrikins. And a lot of that is true. There's no doubt that that is the truth for a lot of these men. That 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 is a stereotype that does apply to some of the men. But I always say to people, we have to remember, you get a big group of people together, you're going to get different characters. As you've said, some are brave, some are not so brave. Some are some are reckless, some are very conservative. If you get a big group of people, like any part of society, you're going to get a cross-section of different people. And to me, again, that's another part that comes out from, from your oral history is, as you've touched on, it's, it's, it's finding those individual stories and, and learning more and, and adding, adding some depth to the story of these people. Not everyone was a Superman. Not everyone wanted to be a hero and win the Victoria Cross. And it's really important. Oh, we're, that- not, we're not all jackos, are we? Exactly, and it's it's really important that we add that those elements to the story that we flesh it out because the men aren't around anymore to tell us. We're not going to be able to sit down with our grandfather anymore and have him tell us about his time in the war. So it's really important that that these stories are recorded so that those aspects are fleshed out and they don't just become caricatures. But I, I, one thing is that I think actually the current gener- generation of, of Australian historians is doing a great job of actually presenting a realistic picture of. The, the AIF. I mean, you've got people like Peter Pedersen, you've got uh, Chris Roberts yourself, you've got uh, um, Aaron Pegram. I'm going to upset people by forgetting them, so I'm going to stop and make it clear there's a lot more. Uh, but what I mean is that there has been a move away from the sort of John Laffin sort of cartoon history towards a more realistic, you know, properly thought out based history, which reflects the the, the, the ups and downs of of the of, uh, of, uh, uh, and, and there's some excellent books coming out on individual formations, which look at the reality of what happened there. There's one on the first division. I can't remember his name. It's just gone out of my head, but but it's a, a, a brilliant book. And there's lots of people doing great work. Dale Blair's done a fantastic book on the, the, the attack on Bellicor. You know, there's people doing great work that that don't cartoonize history, don't try and dumb it down. And it's crucial not to dumb it down, you know. I think you're so right. We we do them a disservice if we uh, if we make them into caricatures and and if we tar them all with the same brush. Um, let's move on to a, another uh, First World War soldier that you interviewed, uh, George Ashurst, um, and he's got some great accounts of actually going into combat and probably accounts that don't reflect the the heroic aspect of charging at the enemy with the bayonet. Tell us about George and his story. Well, George was uh, he was from Wigan and he he, he again had did a, a book called My Bit, which uh, I'd got. Uh, but the interview was spectacular because he has this fantastic sort of Lancashire accent, Wigan accent. And uh, the, 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 the quote I think you've got just, just sums that up perfectly. And it's very short, but it also shows, do you know, they're not plaster saints. They swore, they, they, they did lots of things, they drank, they, they did lots of things they shouldn't have done. And, 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 and the, the, but they were, they were real men in that sense, you know, that they weren't plaster saints. And the, the little short quote I think you're going to play just sums that up, for me anyway. Well, let's, uh, let's hear from George and his account of uh, going over the top during the First World War. Over the top, you know, I'm on top then. It's partly blown down, you know, and I'm just stepping on top and there's a corporal line there. Oh, and all his shoulder, gone. All here was blown away, you know. I think he'd been hit with what they call a whiz bang. And he looks up at me as I passed him. Go on, Corporal, he says, get the bastards. It's just really great stuff, isn't it, Peter? Uh, I, as you say, the, the, the character of the man really comes through in that account when he's talking about going over the top and getting into the bastards. It's, it's just fantastic stuff. Well, it made me laugh. It made me laugh when he told it. We, we suppress laughter, by the way, and we don't encourage him. That's part of the rules of oral history. So I sort of do a silent laughing. And I can assure you when he said that, I was laughing, you know. Although it's a terrible moment, and later on they're in the sunken road and, and, and most of his friends are killed. So there you go. That's, that's what war's like. It's awful. There's another aspect to it as well, which is uh, when these men are away from their families, away from their home for often very long periods of time, sentiment is very important to them, remembering things from home and... Um, and we're going to play another quote now from George Horridge, which uh, really, really sums that up. Um, what can you tell us about George and, and, his, and, and his oral history? Uh, George Horridge owned Bury, basically. His address was Lake Hill Bury. He was a very wealthy businessman. He was very wealthy then as well. 
And I remember the interview well. He picked me up in a Rolls Royce. I'd got a hangover because I was very young then. And uh, he picked me up in this Rolls Royce, drove like a maniac, took me home and gave me a, a, some yellow, whatever that yellow spirit is, to, to, to try and bring me around. But anyway, we, we did the interview in a professional manner, obviously, once he'd got, given me that. And uh, at one point, he was talking about Gallipoli, and he, play, he sang this song, Homeland. Now, I, I, when he sang it, I just looked at him, and it was so emotional. Uh, even I'm not that emotional, but I felt, I felt it then. And even now, we play it at the cemeteries at Gallipoli, and I think I sent you a copy once for your tours. Uh, and it, it 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 can bring a tear, you know, and, and I, I, you can actually hear me switch it off at the end because the War Museum don't record people when they're upset. We switch it off, get them a glass of water and help them recover. We don't we don't gloat in it like some of the media do. Anyway, let, let's let, let them listen to it and they can make their own minds up. But as the time went on and we got into nice weather, and then at night the, the fellas used to have sing songs on the deck. And I always remember one thing they sang, which even today, I think it's terribly sad. It is, um, it is a, a song that went like this. Homeland, homeland, when shall I see you again? Land of my birth, dearest land on earth, homeland, homeland, when shall I see you again? It may be for years, or it may be forever, dear homeland. I think cry now. Wow, that's really wonderful stuff, Peter. I, I see what you mean. It's just, it, 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 it does bring a tear to your eye. And again, it, it adds that element of humanity that is often missing from, I mean, I'm sounding like a broken record now, but it, it adds these elements of humanity that are missing from other historic records. It does. Uh, I, I think just, just one thing I'd like to say about oral history is people often say, do we believe everything people say? Um, and, and the answer is, you treat it oral history like any other evidence you know uh, it's important that you actually analyze what's said you check it against the official records you know the rest of it um what, what the, the, i think oral history gives fantastic detail about the nitty-gritty of life you know um things that sort of bring you closer and it's weird because some of those aspects are, are, are just what we we have in our normal life today like the, the fray bentos tins uh, the corned beef tins then are very similar to the ones in britain today and probably in australia as well there's the same key on the top and the rest of it um but then other things are like they're from a foreign planet because our society has moved on you just cannot imagine how that would be the norm and all history brings that out because they've sort of gone to that. Uh, you know, it's just amazing how they bring that out. Um, the problem, the worst problem with oral history, and, and I think you have to think about these things, is people are not great at actual battle stories. Murray's an exception, Joe Murray. But most people go into a sort of daze. And if you actually think, if your Australian police went into a pub to break up a fight and they asked what happened, this is 20 minutes after it happened, they'd get four or five different accounts of what happened it would be quite difficult to establish what happened because people go into shock. And it's crucial to remember with the battle action accounts that the individual was in shock, you know, and that then you add 70 years. And so what, you, what we find with a lot of battle experiences are that they're sort of generic. They're sort of, you know, the countdown, they're going over the top. And then a lot of them describe being on their own in no man's land. Do you know what I mean? Now, they're not in there. They're, they're not on their own. They're in a crowd of people moving forward across no man's land. But they feel as if they're on, the, in, on their own. And the account's got a very blurry and hazy effect. Uh, I, I find it quite fascinating. You mentioned the importance of accuracy, and, and I think it's fairly uh, – it's, it's, every, everyone would understand how people's memories can fade over time, and these were quite shocking events that are hard for them to recall. But in your experience, have you come across accounts of blatant fabrication of, of made-up stories from the veterans? Um, I've come across one or two uh, gross over-exaggerations. But do you know what? I think I can spot them. Um, you know, because it, if something's unbelievable, it's probably not true. And, and that's very much. I mean, I, I had a chap. I'm not going to name him. 
But he reckoned he, he was patrolling in no man's land and he saw three Germans coming along and he went, he had his knob carry or whatever they, they called it, you know, the, 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 the club thing. And he reckoned he just went bonk, bonk, bonk and knocked the three out. Now, <clears throat> I, I, I treat that account with a, a great deal of skepticism. Now, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying that I treat it with skepticism. And, you know, when you when you get some VC stories, I'm not saying they're not true. I'm saying you have to treat them with skepticism. Have a look. As it happens, we mentioned uh, Jacker. Uh, um, I actually believe his accounts because uh, they're corroborated, um, you know, and that's what you need. You need corroboration if something's almost unbelievable. Uh, it's very important. Uh, or, or If you believe everything someone tells you, they'll just tell you fantasy land, you know. It's obviously your great skill as oral historian is to see through that, and I, I think it's a really important part of of the work that you do. I mean, in some ways, I think even the even the stories that are a little bit more fantastic, uh, you know, perhaps still tell a story about the mindset of the people at the time, or or how that they've dealt with the the conflict uh, in the years since. So, I mean, it's all it's all just such amazing stuff, and I can imagine the very varied as well. Every interview you've done um, with all of these individuals. Oh, very, very. I mean, you know, uh, there's as many different responses to a wartime situation as there are, there are, um, you know, um, individuals. That was our great problem in Great War interviewing was that we didn't have enough raw material. Isn't that awful to refer to people as raw material? It's a bit like the generals in the First World War at times. But we didn't have enough survivors who were fit and well enough to be able to do two hour sessions, you know, a number of two hour sessions across weeks or months, however long it took. To, to actually do the interviews. Um, and so we tried to get a large number from a certain regiment, the D Durham Light Infantry, the Northumberland Fusiliers, the Royal Fusiliers. We tried. We tried to get a fair number. And we just couldn't. You know, we're lucky to get one from each battalion or two, you know. Um, so in the Second World War, what we resolved to do was to take an infant, a couple of infantry battalions, um, uh, well, one, one regiment, the Durham Light Infantry, and because and, they fought on every front, and then one artillery regiment, and uh, I believe you've got some examples for us. And that was the South Knots Hussars, 107 Regiment Royal Artillery. And the idea was, if you interview, say, I think we did about 50 from the, uh, the early part of the war uh, on them. We did about 80 to 100 in all. And what you get is one bloke tells a story, and if you put your hand in front of you, you can see the, the gaps where the finger, you know, the space between the fingers are. But if you put the other, if you put another hand behind it, crossways, you can't see through it so well. If you put 20 or 30 accounts from the same unit going through the same experiences, then you start to see what you get is a phenomenon uh, which uh, st statisticians are aware of, which is you get the rogue story. You, you know, there's some people who exaggerate one way, some people exaggerate another. And then you'll find the rest of them balance in the middle. And and and, and this was incredibly successful with the South Knots Hussars who were a highly educated bunch. Um, a lot of them went to Nottingham Grammar School uh, and they ended up in the artillery. A lot of them were commissioned, the, the ordinary lads who joined in 1939. Uh, but but they fought at, uh, in 1940, for, sort of 40 to 1942 in the ranks. But they were bright, intelligent lads. I'm not saying all commissioned officers are bright and intelligent, but don't get me wrong. What I mean is they were a bright, intelligent bunch. And when we interviewed them, instead of being 96, they were about 66. They're between 60 and 70. And the, 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 the interview length was much longer and the level of detail was much better. And their voice strength and their, the way they talk was much more what we're used to in normal people. I'm 63. Their voices sound like mine. Well, we've got some fantastic quotes coming up. We're going to listen to the audio of some of these interviews. But before we do that, can you give us a bit of background? I mean, the specific units we're talking about are the artillery guys who were serving in North Africa. Yeah, the artillery guys were the South Knots Hussars, and uh, they'd been a cavalry regiment, had fought in the First World War as, as uh, yeomanry, you know, uh, converted, I think, to a machine gun battalion. And then in, in the 20s, they'd been made an artillery unit. And they went to war with, uh, well, originally 18-pounders. Uh, and then they were converted to 25 pounders, the gun howitzer, which is a classic gun of the uh, of the Second World War. And they fought. Well, first they were in Palestine, and then they moved across to the Western Desert. And they fought all the way through the Western Desert campaign. But uh, in on well, in back end of May, and in, they, they were all the way through the, the siege of Tobruk. What what stories you've got from that? I've got I've not given you any of them, but I can assure you the stories are unbelievable. And then, and then they went on, and they, 
they thought they got through their Somme because they thought of Tobruk as their really big battle. And then they were caught up in the German offensive on the Gazala lines, which started, I think, on uh, 27th of May, 1942. Uh, I'm vague with dates. Terrible. I know it's uh, embarrassing for historians, but, be, but dates are not being a historian. It's what it's understanding things. And, you know, um, and they fought in a battle for about a week, which culminated on the 6th of June with the unit being surrounded by tanks and fighting to the last man, the last round. What a story. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the character that stands out most is a man for me, Sergeant uh, Ray Ellis, who hadn't at that point written a book, uh, but he, he, he did before he died. He died a couple of years ago now. Uh, but I interviewed him when he was 70. And uh, the account's unbelievable. Um, you know, it, his account of the Battle of Knightsbridge, which is what we're talking about, 6th of June, 1942, is unbelievable. You know, it's just amazing. Uh, the detail, the 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 the, 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 the it's unbelievable. Uh, how you aim a gun, you know, um, uh, how you deal with a bunch of tanks coming across you, how you aim at them. Uh, one of his friends is wounded, you know, one, not one of his friends, one of the people who are manning the, the gun, a, a signal, I think it was, who was just helping out of the gun, uh, how he was killed. And, and it, it, it's fantastic. And, you know, uh, later on, there's the, j- j- right at the end, the tanks are actually on the position. And the second in command of the regiment, a major Robert Daniel, orders them to form British Square. Now, we've got his account of that. I, I can't give it to you, but I've got someone who heard it. Uh, who, you know, we've got his driver's account. We've got the people who got the order. And, and what happened is they tried to form a square with the guns and the limbers and the rest of it, which is ludicrous, <clears throat> with tanks actually on the position. And the tanks just blew them away with machine gun fire and, and, and a couple of shells. And one of the chaps I, I've given to you, Ted Whitaker, gives a, 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 a just a, 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 an amazing account of what happened. And that, for me, is the difference between our First World War collection and our Second World War collection. The War Museum let me concentrate on certain units to represent the others. We had another interview who was going out interviewing lots and lots of short interviews to cover the whole of the story of the war. But I was allowed to concentrate on just these three or four units to get a closer picture from 40, 50, 60, 70 men of the same incidents. And wow, it worked brilliantly, or I think it did. I think you're absolutely right. Let's hear from Ray Ellis uh, describing that action where the tanks are closing in and firing their guns at the tanks. When you're actually firing at tanks which are approaching, you take scant notice of the tank you've just fired at because you're looking at the next and you're very excited Again, it depends where the shell hits the tank. If it hits it on the track, it's going to blow the track off, isn't it, obviously? And the tank will slew and stop. That means you can put another one into it and set it on fire, because he's slewed round, and you bring him, or get him, and you pull him round, bang one in the back of him, and he'll, like, he'll hit him, and he'll explode and brew up. But by this time, there's probably, you can see somebody's coming over from the lake, getting close to you, so you whip the gun round, have a go at him. Sometimes you'll fire the shell and the tank would it'll explode, hit the tank, and the tank would come keep coming. You'd probably hit him on the turret with a high explosive shell. It's probably given everybody in the tank a headache, but it didn't stop the tank or kill them all, and they could keep coming. You'd carry on firing, but you see, you're not just firing at one tank. You think, I better go have a go at him, he's getting a bit close. You, you pull your gun around and have a go at another one. All you're looking at, to be absolutely honest, all you're looking at are the few tanks that are coming near your gun. And all you're thinking about is not saving the British Empire. <laughs> all you're thinking about is protecting your gun and yourself and knocking out of any tanks that look dangerous to you. Pete, I see what you were saying just about the the response of the, the World War II guys who, as you say, were a little bit younger when you interviewed them. The, the quality of their memory, even as you say, the strength in their voice, it, it does paint a, a, a picture um, that we don't often see because now any World War II veterans that survive and are interviewed, we roll them out on Anzac Day and on Remembrance Day and interview them and obviously their memories uh, are not as sharp as they were uh, 20 or 30 years ago. I, I can certainly see what you mean, that, that those are incredible accounts from the World War II veterans. Well, Ray Ellis, I mean, these guys, you know, and, and there were 40, 50, 60 of them who, from that from that battle uh, they described everything. They described a uh, gun drill in detail, exactly what every member from each member of the team, you know, the layer, the, 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 the loader numbers, the sergeant, 
Everything that they did, they described the role of the officers. Uh, of the uh, of the gunnery acts, the gunnery assistants who did the, they described uh, the, uh, the, I never understood a word of it because maths and history don't go together, but they described the trigonometry they used to hit the target, you know, to correct the rate. They described ranging. You know, this is in much greater detail than we got from First World War people. And you could compare it. And again, they're talking about the same people. So when they talk about an officer being a bit of a swine, we have an interview with that officer, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, the men love me. Well, did they is the, the question, uh, you know, um, that, that you have to look to, you know, um, sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. Uh, but but it, it does give you a much better picture of the whole thing. I think you're so right. And you, you touched on this point very, very briefly before. And I, I want to come back to it because it's so important. It does paint such a complete picture. And we have that for the Second World War, thanks to this great work you've done. We have it in a small amount for the First World War. But as you say, imagine we could have done this for Waterloo. Imagine we could have done this back through the centuries. Imagine we had some method 100 years ago or 200 years ago of recording the the experiences of these individuals who fought in these great, great campaigns. And I just think about what we lost by not being able to do that, by not being able to have that, uh, that, that recollection of the men that were there. And to me, that sums up why oral history is so important. Well, it was started too late in a lot of countries, you know. So we started in the early 70s here, and we did 50 interviews on the First World War, and then we thought we'd done it. Uh, you know, I restarted it with the with the support and backing of my colleagues in the Sound Archive, and the money supplied by by my, you know, by the the museum itself. And we then interviewed more like 2,000 more in the 80s, and that was more appropriate. But we've done tens of thousands of Second World War ones, you know. Uh, and, you know, they're now starting to be less detailed. They're now starting to be like the First World War ones. You know, some are very good. I did a 70, what, uh, 35 hour interview with uh, with a, a navigator from uh, from uh, uh, bombers uh, operating out of Italy. And, you know, and he was only in action about six months. But going through all his training, all the techniques he used, the aircraft he flew, he was mainly Sterling's. Um, it was unbelievable. The guy was, he was sat there, he was 94, but uh, he was quite frail. Uh, but but he, he, he had the determination to leave his story and he name checked every member of his crews and he gave me a, a potted history of them, how what they did. And if they were killed, he, he spoke about that, about when they were killed and about how he felt about that. That, that to me was an amazing privilege. To, 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 to be to be able to interview that chap again I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to give you an example from his, his work but you know I think you can get my enthusiasm for it from from what I'm talking about well I think you've hit the nail on the head Pete the word privilege it is you know I'm I'm I feel privileged to be speaking to you about it and I think all of our listeners would be the same that it's just it's it's wonderful to hear these words uh, from the men in their own voices and um, well let's let's carry on with that let's go back to Ray Ellis the man we're talking about from that battle in the western desert in 1942. Um, and let's hear that, that very moving account about the, the death of his comrade um, after he was caught by machine gun fire. And this man caught a burst of machine gun fire right in his bottom, right in his bottom part of his body. And I can remember it because he jumped an instinctive muscle movement. And I bet he jumped five foot in the air. I've never seen anything like it. almost like a circus turn. It must have been sort of some nervous reaction as these bullets hit him. He jumped in there and dropped on the floor and the bottom of his body was just worked away. And I can remember looking, I'd complete stranger, and looking at this blood and he was frightened. Remember this, he was frightened. He was, his eyes were terrified and uh, I can remember crouching down and trying to, um, you know, console him. And I can remember saying to him, all this noise going around and, and I can remember saying, you're all right, lad, you're all right. Don't worry, you're not badly wounded. We'll soon have you away. You'll be all right. I reckon you've got a blighty. Soon you were back in and, and talking like this to him and uh, trying to um, ease his fear because he... And while I was talking to him, I noticed that the sun was settling on his eyes and he wasn't, he was dead. He died in my arm. Wow. I mean, what an account. I mean, you, that, it puts you there, doesn't it? I mean, you are there with him as he holds his comrades his comrade in his arms as, as that man dies. I did a talk once where I played some of the interviews of these guys, you know, from his unit. And he, by then, was one of the last two or three alive. And <clears throat> he spoke. He'd been a headmaster. After the war, he was a headmaster. 
You know, he was a tall, erect, proud man. He was by then, you know, he's pushing, he's pushing 90 by then when we did that talk. And he was an amazing character, you know, and the whole interview, he escaped uh, from prison. Well, it's one, uh, he was in Italy and it's when the Germans sort of took over and he got away during the handover from the he, he was captured in that and action he, wasn't he the, the end of the story that oh yes talking about, no, they're, all cap- they're all captured, yeah. captured or killed basically uh, except for robert daniel who uh, managed to escape he said uh, the royal Art- rha regulars uh, never surrender so he drove off and he was the only one to escape which did cause some discord in the unit afterwards but i interviewed robert daniel and do you know what not his story was his story. And, you know, I did not have contempt for him or anything like that. I, I understood what he was talking about. He had his own way of operating. He'd been brought up to do certain things and he did them. And his story of that battle was that he tried to get them to evacuate out of that position earlier. They wouldn't. You know, his, uh, his the, the, the brigadier general and the general above wouldn't move them. He warned them what would happen. He and and. and he wouldn't surrender because he didn't surrender. Hence his desperation of ordering square, form square. And that was the madness that I think you're going to hear now. And the next account is, I think, the best of the ones you've got. Well, let's hear that account. This is from Ted Whitaker, who describes uh, that moment as the, uh, as the Germans are closing in and, uh, and they're forming square. So let's hear from Ted now. Major Daniels drove up and shouted, Form British Square. He said, go and, go and form upon 426, who, were, as I say, were over to our right. I rushed up when I heard him this, and the gunners, they got fortunate from heaven knows where the quads were still in action. They went and hooked the guns in, and I went to get on the a limber. Not being able to get on there, I rushed, the truck was moving, and I rushed, I grabbed hold of the door, and put one foot in the footrest. So I was hanging on the side of the door with one foot on and holding me on through the, you know, the window was down, hanging on. And the, there were two or three chaps sitting on the limber instead of getting in the, and uh, the nearest one, a chap called Harrison, Derby County footballer, he was on the books of Derby County. The others I didn't know. We went a few yards and there was a most horrible whomp and I glanced around, couldn't quite see what happened. There were some awful moans at the back. Brought us to a standstill. And as I jumped off, I looked back, and the first shell had hit these boats in the middle. And this poor Harrison, oh, it was a terrible sight. And he'd, it was practically in half, and the others. It had just hit them. Oh, dear. I dropped off and threw myself flat. The driver... Uh, another quite a popular chap, uh, Steve, we call him, Stevenson. It got halfway out the door and the next armour piercing came straight through the driving cab. And there was poor Stevenson left hanging over the, the door. And I did about three more yards and found a slit trench and dropped in it. Peter, what a harrowing account that is. I mean... You know, as we've as we've said several times, it's about it's about that personal experience and effectively putting you there where where this was all going on. But gee, that one I think really um really paints a, a, a terrible picture of what was going on. Well, and what happens to named individuals? And there's no glamour in war in that way. I mean, these are horrible, brutal things that happen to people, living, breathing chaps who who were his friends, uh, and sometimes not his friends. But that doesn't really matter in those circumstances, you know. Uh, this idea everyone likes everyone else. Well, actually, they didn't all like each other, but they were all comrades in in the bigger sense. And uh, you know, it was uh, it was a horrific, uh, you know, it was it was madness to try and do that. They should have just surrendered. Well, I think that comes out. I think the madness of the situation and the, the obviously the price those men paid in uh, in those closing stages of that battle is is comes out very clearly in those um in those quotes. It's it's really wonderful. Um. Pete, it's been fantastic. This has been, I, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for, for bringing this uh, to to us all and for, for sharing your great experiences. I, I think it's so fantastic that you don't take this for granted, the, the, the wonderful experiences, the privilege you've had of speaking to these men. But tell me, in your opinion, um, what's the future of oral history? We, we, we've done as much as we can do with the First World War, probably 90% of what we can do with the Second World War. What do you see the future of oral history? 
Um, well, I'm I'm working on that. I, 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 but we've now divided. I work for the Cold War Group, and I'm doing. Uh, I've done a lot of work on national servicemen because national service. I don't, I don't think it happened in Australia. I can't remember. Yes, it did. Uh, but in the 50s, uh, throughout the 50s, people were called up, and I've done hundreds of those. Uh, amazing experience. Very interesting. Some of them went off to be clerks in the RAF and did nothing. Some of them ended up in Korea fighting, uh, fighting, you know, in the Korean War. Uh, amazing experiences. Again, we concentrate on one unit, the Royal Norfolk Regiment. Got some amazing accounts. Um, we uh, we did all the colonial conflicts, um, and then you know we did the cold. We do the Cold War itself. But what what in a way makes me sad? Uh, and and do you know what? I was 25, 26 when I started interviewing. I was interviewing people who were 88 to 96, even 100. The oldest I interviewed was, I think, 104. Um, and but now, because of the Iraq wars and the Gulf, the, the Gulf, the Iraq war and Afghanistan, I'm now into. I'm now interviewing some people who are people are only 21, 22, and I'm now in my 60s. And it, it's made me realise, you know, it's this this concept of it's not all finished. You know, the, the, there is the idea of no more war uh, that they had in the 60s. It, it's not happened. I'm not sure it ever will. Um, and and the work goes on and the work has to go on, I think, to record the experiences of people in the services and the people, in, you know, who caught up in war uh, and to reflect what it's really like for individuals with being caught up in, in such a, a terrible experience. Uh, you know, some of them enjoy it. Let's be, you know, that's something that's a bit of a secret. Some people love it. Uh, they they enjoy the war. They enjoy the chat. They enjoy some people. Very few uh, seem to enjoy killing. But for most, it's a terrible, haunting experience, which they they've dealt with in various ways throughout the rest of their lives. But now I'm interviewing people who were on the streets of Northern Ireland during the Northern Ireland troubles who have got post-traumatic stress. Uh, we tend not to say disorder because in our view, it's a natural reaction to the stress that they've been put under. You know, people going down the streets of Belfast, which is very like the streets of Liverpool or Newcastle or Glasgow. They look identical. So the stress when they return, very high levels of stress. Um, and, and so the work goes on. And I am very, inc I'm incredibly lucky to be able to do it. Um, I'm proud of what myself and the members of the Sound Archive, all of them, every single one who's worked for the Sound Archive has contributed as much as I have. Uh, with, you know, there are catalogers, there's people working in the studios, there's everybody's working as a team. And, and of course, I'm grateful to the War Museum who had the foresight uh, and the brain power, if you like, to, to actually spend the money on this oral history program. Because it's not cheap, you know, to do it properly, to do thousands of interviews as we have. I think we're on 35,000 interviews overall or 35,000 records, you know, um, and it it's just fantastic. I've been very lucky and I've still got a couple of years before my retirement age and then I'm going to become a tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete, it's been, it's been absolutely brilliant. I can't thank you enough for the, uh, the, 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 the insight you've given us and sharing those wonderful memories of these men. It's been, it's been absolutely fantastic. The book, uh, if you want to hear more from Peter, is Voices from the Front. Um, I've read it. It's fantastic. These accounts of the First World War um, many more than we had time to go through today. But um, Peter Hart, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll definitely get you back on the show again in the future. Thank you very much, Matt. Cheers.